Okay, good day, good evening, everyone, whatever the case may be. Um, thanks for joining this webinar on how to make uh, building infrastructure, infrastructure smarter with Laura Wan. Uh, it's brought to you by the Laura Alliance, and members of the Smart Building Work Group will be participating and presenting to you today. With that, we'll just jump right into a few housekeeping notes here. I uh, won't read through all of these, but um, an on demand version of the webcast will be available and the slides will be available for downloading. Um, please take note that uh, if you do have questions, to su submit them through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will answer the questions at the end of the webcast. And if you have any um, delays or issues with the pages refreshing, push F5 and that will usually um, solve the problem. Uh, and you can kind of quickly look at the other uh, notes there. Um, so let's meet the speakers. Um, I'm yours truly, Byron B. Miller. Um, I've been chairing this Smart Buildings Work Group in the Laura Alliance. Um, I'm also the Director of Laura Business Development at Semtech, who is a semiconductor chip manufacturer um, and provides Laura chips on, upon which the Laura WAN protocol from the Laura Alliance uh, runs. Uh, also joining me today is uh, Frederick Gallo. Um, he's the Director of Marketing from NG Virtus. Um, and he's going to be talking a little bit uh, about how Laura has been used to create value for businesses uh, uh, through HVAC um, optimization. Um, Dan Quant um, is Vice President of Strategic Dis Development at Multitech, um, and he's going to talk uh, about uh, how app what application owners must take into account when deploying LoRa WAN applications in smarter buildings. David um, Chirino, um, who's the IoT Solution Sales Manager from Renaissance, um, he's going to talk about how you can fuse LoRa WAN into existing building management systems. And Seth Taylor, who's CTO and co-founder of Kairos, uh, will talk about how to mitigate risk. Um, getting using real-time data collected by LoRaWAN devices. So it should be a very interesting webinar, um, and uh, we look forward to their presentations. So a couple intro slides. Uh, for people that are not overly familiar with LoRaWAN, um, it is a, uh, a major component as to why buildings are getting sp smarter, and um, I don't think there's any doubt that um, the industry is moving towards smarter buildings. So why is Laura Wan um, ideal for this? Um, for one, it offers a uh, fantastic power consumption, which is great for battery-powered devices that have to be placed in hard-to-reach locations. Um, the quickest way to kill ROI on a project is to have to go replace batteries all the time. Human uh, intervention is always the most expensive part of any project, and so um, long battery-powered devices, life devices, um, are ideal for uh, collecting data. Um, it isn't uh, a standard um, within ITU now um, and is a, a product of the nonprofit Laura Alliance and is such as an open non-proprietary standard. Um, fantastic coverage and range from single gateway. Um, many buildings can be covered with a single gateway. Uh, extremely good noise interference uh, characteristics um, and uh, 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 can even cover outside of buildings very easily. Uh, the architecture is inherently redundant, so if you um, are, uh, the data you're collecting is very important, uh, you will automatically get redundancy by deploying multiple gateways. And there's a, a wide e ecosystem of devices and gateways that have been developed over the last uh, five to seven years um, uh, by members of the Laura Alliance and those that are not members of the Laura Alliance as well. Um, at the kind of the top of everybody's agenda corporately these days is um, uh, ESG goals, um, lots of social pressures and investment pressures, um, but also the realization that um, it's just good business these days. So um, and, and it can save companies mo money. So uh, monitoring and controlling things remotely um, is a perfect use case for IoT. Um, in many cases, you have to prove compliance um, with regulatory requirements, and to do that, you need to collect uh, data. Uh, and you combine the fact that we've got these fantastic wireless protocols with long battery life now, um, you combine that with cloud computing and advanced uh, data analytics, and um, you know the ability to analyze data, collect data, 
and utilize that data is easier now and um, more cost effective than at any time in history. So uh, uh, quickly, I will um, review how you could use LoRaWAN in um, you know, sort of an existing building automation environment. Um, the difference between these two drawings here, I won't go into great detail, but essentially the left-hand side of the drawing shows how you can use uh, traditional BACnet devices and carry those over a LoRaWAN network wirelessly. Um, the right hand of the drawing shows how you would use uh, LoRaWAN enabled devices and then integrate that data into a BACnet or other building automation uh, system. Uh, today we're going to mostly be talking about the right hand side of the, uh, the drawing here, um, but you, you can certainly do the left hand side as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Frederick as our first speaker. And um, Frederick, uh, take it away. Thank you, Byron, for, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Frederic Gaillot. I'm a CMO of uh, NG Virtuos. We are specialized on uh, smart building systems, uh, mainly regarding uh, energy efficiency. Um, First, I just wanted to give uh, maybe a business uh, feedback and background around uh, around smart building because I think we, we are we are at kind of a turn point for for the moment uh, regarding a smart building industry. Um, and basically, I just wanted to testimony the way that um, now technology is able to to create value for for the customer while just enabling just new business model for for them. Um, if we look back here at the smart building challenges, what we are in, what we had uh, to face with was uh, first the technical complexity. Um, we had so many challenges to face uh, regarding the IoT, regarding the data collect, infrastructure, and stuff like that. So that was my first point. How we could deal with that technical complexity? Uh, the second point we had to face was just the operational issues. Um, first regarding the deployment, the way we could uh, just put the IoT, the, the way to, to put the gateways, uh, all the, 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 the wire we had to deploy do in, the, in the smart building. So we had so many challenges to, to face, and uh, they were also in the operating and maintenance stage. So it was really a big deal for, for everybody to, to face with that challenges. Um, and the third point, I mean, it's the most important. Um, what was the business model? We had we had some cost issue to face, and basically a lot of capex to for for the business model, a lot of opex. And well, if I want to summarize, for a long time we were just like we were just providing great use cases for everybody, and it was a shiny period. Everybody was wow, we, we are able to to provide great use cases. But the problem was the business model. Uh, most of the time, we, we, we were just uh, we were just in front of the the lack of, uh, uh, of performance for the business model, and the return on investment was just uh, not easy to find. So, who was really ready to pay for 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 that smart building uh, solution? So, I just want to test him on I with a, a product we have, uh, which is called Virtuos Control. Uh, basically, um, a digital solution mixing IoT, cloud, predictive and machine learning, uh, we, which uh, enables and optimizes all the HVAC systems' behavior. Um, we are providing uh, first uh, a system that collects the, the, the real use of the building, so we have quite a lot of, uh, um, of IoT deployed in the building, basically to monitor occupation, temperature, uh, air quality, and everything. Uh, we are collecting and gathering all that data in uh, in the cloud. Okay, we have uh, uh, proprietary AI predictive and uh, and model and machine learning systems that uh, are mixing, collecting, crossing the data, and uh, giving back the, the optimizing uh, instruction in order to control uh, all the HVAC systems. And uh, if we if we take a, um, a closer look to uh, to the installation principle, what we can see is that we are uh, basically trying to optimize both the pro heating production, 
and also the temperature regulation for a room by room. So we, we are quite using a lot of IoT. So it was really important to find the best technical solution for us. And Laura gave us a lot of great value for, for that. Um, we are using two kinds of sensors. The first one are just to collect the data. Okay, as I said before, we are uh, trying to get uh, all the temperature, uh, air quality, uh, occupation. This is mainly the, the, the data we are gathering and using. Um, all of that data, it's on the left of the slide, are uh, collected through the gateway, sent to uh, the back end and the cloud, and then went, are going back to the connected uh, objects, which basically are actuators that are um, uh, optimizing the way that uh, edge, uh, heating and cooling are distributed within the building. This is the, the, first, uh, the first part of the solution. And the second one is just more dedicated to the production of uh, heating and cooling. And basically, we are just trying to, to work with, uh, with the standard of, of the business and smart building industry, basically Modbus and BACnet. Maybe Modbus is a bit more uh, widespread here in Europe. I don't know, but uh, we are tr trying to work with that uh, with that two uh, two kind of uh, of protocol in order to to optimize the production. And uh, basically, what we are seeing at the moment uh, is just uh, uh, the way that this solution is nowadays uh, uh, deployed on more than 300 buildings at the moment. And uh, the first the first point I want to stress is the reliability of uh, of the solution and the protocol. A lot of value, uh, and it's also uh, the, the the way the, the best the best uh, solution in order to have an industrial deployment uh, nowadays for for the smart building. Um, the second point is of course. Um, the efficiency regarding especially energy savings. Well, at the moment, uh, energy, especially in Europe, is just uh, uh, something very important as the prices are rising up. And uh, in, it's important to, uh, to deliver solutions that give value for the customer in order to reduce drastically their energy consumption. And um, uh, regarding the 300 buildings we are already optimizing, we are able to deliver an average of uh, less 25% for, for energy savings, which means a lot of value for the customer at the moment. And of course, we are also providing a value regarding the decarbonized uh, journey as we also reduce the CO2 uh, uh, emission for, for their buildings. Um, third point uh, is the way as we are not only providing a solution, but we are also operating solution, and something very important, as we are very, very careful with the, the way we can optimize, uh, of course, the life of, uh, of the solution. And in uh, operation and maintenance perspective, it's really important for us uh, to have very few gateway to take to deal with, and this is something very important. We'll see after that it's also has a financial impact, of course. But on uh, operation and maintenance perspective, it's very important as we are able to, uh, uh, to deploy quite easily and quite fast, and it's something very important for us. And during the lifetime of the product, it's also easier for us to, uh, to have reliable uh, hardware, and it's, uh, it's something that's very important for, for us. So it's uh, something we have to stress. Uh, the way we can easily deploy and operate the, the whole solution. And the first point I want to share with you, and I think it's the most important because I'm not a tech technical guy. My point is, is just to, to testimony the fact that uh, uh, sometimes technology enables uh, for us new business model for our customer. And what we've seen, uh, reducing the number of gateway, simplifying operation and maintenance, we were just able to uh, have a much more uh, attractive financial model for our customer. And basically reducing the capex, improving uh, return on investment was just key for the success of the solution. And uh, I think it's something important at the moment. That's why in my introduction, I was just talking about maybe a kind of turn point. 
the fact is not what the use case we are able to do, because we are able to do a lot of use case since a long time. But what seems to be very important for me on a more business perspective is the way that now we can also propose to the customer attractive financial model. And, well, Byron, that was my point. Very good. Thank you, Frederick. Um, interesting to see real-life real use cases with uh, real-life returns. Uh, we'll move on now to Dan Quant um, from Multitech. Multitech's a longtime member and supporter of the Lower Alliance. Uh, really appreciate that, Daniel. Um, and uh, interested to hear what you have to say. Yeah, thanks, Byron. Founding member back in 2015. It's, uh, it's been a long journey. Absolutely. Um, today, I'd like to take a few minutes to detail how the success of LoRaWAN is in part due to the flexibility of how a LoRaWAN network can be operated and deployed to best meet the needs of the application. So the network agility of LoRaWAN has a big impact on the performance, the business model of an application, as Frederick highlighted earlier, not to mention the return on investment and the ongoing financial payoff for the entity paying. The, the basics, right? In any LoRaWAN application, just like a cellular or an Ethernet network, you provide the end nodes, uh, likely a capital expense, and you need to be able to retrieve the data um, into your analytics platform, your business system, like an ERP, or even perhaps a, a control system. So, so these are the basics with LoRaWAN. The, the end nodes, perhaps sensors, and how are you going to get that data into your platform? So the key decisions that have an impact to the performance, the business model, and the financial payoff include the model of, of how to achieve this. So is that going to be a sensor to cloud model? Is it going to be a um, sensor to a control on-prem control system? Um, are you better off using a public carrier? Does your application perhaps dictate uh, a private network investment? And and how do you um, how do you architect the network? A more centralized approach, or perhaps more distributed? So let's have a little look at some of those options, shall we? So uh, so sensor to cloud, right? Very easy model um, being used extensively in the industry today. Uh, essentially, LoRaWAN sensor into a gateway into a cloud-based platform. And this is the quickest way to scale. It's simple to gather, access, process, visualize, and analyze data. It all comes up to a central repository where you can do all of these um, uh, things with your data. There's no custom network or system integration. It could be just as simple as cable tying a sensor onto a motor or a generator um, and then seeing data appear in your application within a couple of minutes. Um, and the way in which you pick up your data from the application server is likely a standard internet protocol like MQTT or HTTP. So, so again, doesn't require any OT skill sets. And this is ideal for sensor harvesting applications like condition-based monitoring of motors and pumps and out-of-spec alerts um, around um, um, environmental conditions, alarms and updates when the heat of something goes above a certain level or perhaps below a level. Where, um, where sensor to on-prem systems have a lot of advantages is where you don't want that data to ever leave the building. Perhaps it's very secure and you want to keep it on-prem. You want to be able to maybe lower your OPEX costs so that you're not running up costs for cloud-based compute and storage and the backhaul costs to get the data up there and back. And perhaps you want a more resilient approach whereby you are define the network um, in order to, to make sure that you have a redundancy, maybe. And, and this is ideal for 
control systems, typically closed loop control applications like um, lighting, uh, heating ventilation systems, access control, security systems, uh, all the types of applications where you want that data to remain on-prem and feed directly into that on-prem control system. So, so now how to decide what kind of network you want here. Um, remember, you always supply the end nodes. You're the one pulling the data out of uh, that network. Uh, if you go with a public carrier, maybe you have coverage around you, so it's very simple to do that. Maybe you don't have coverage um, quite where you want it, so you can perhaps even invest in some gateways, and you can take those gateways and subscribe them to a public network server service, and you can configure your gateways to pack it forward in there. And by doing so, you've essentially increased the reach and the capacity of that public network to better service your own end nodes. So let's look at some of those advantages. So obviously there's a low CapEx expense. Maybe you, you use your own gateways, maybe you don't. Um, but you don't have to spend too much money building out a network. Uh, the network is there for you. You get great mobility if you're trying to track assets moving between buildings across a whole country that's perhaps covered by a LoRaWAN network, France being a good example of that. Um, then you have full nationwide mobility and you have that speed of deployment, a little bit like the uh, sensor to cloud model. The network's all there. It's just about connecting assets, pulling your data off in a few minutes. The disadvantages are that OPEX cost can eat you alive. Um, those ongoing fees per device, so a million devices on the network, you buy another one, then that's a million and one devices that have an ongoing OPEX cost. And you know, coverage limitations may that, um, be an issue, although with LoRa you, you have the ability to bring your own gateway model. And probably not always the greatest um, approach for integration and control of local systems. A private network, on the other hand, provides you that lowest OPEX cost. You're not paying per endpoint um, for you know, a million and one devices or something. You build the network for the capacity that you need, and, and really that's your cost, the initial build out cost and, and of course the, the maintenance of that network that you've put in. You get that data privacy and protection because you've built the network. You get a deterministic performance exactly where you need it for the application that you're trying to service. And with that comes a great deal of control and resiliency that you can put in place. Uh, of course, the disadvantages are there are initial build out costs. So if it's a few sensors that you're trying to connect, this is going to be a high capex expense. Um, but if you have a number of sensors um, in a facility, uh, perhaps you'll see a return on investment in maybe as little as nine to 18 months. Um, particularly if your assets are, um, are clustered in that environment, which is a key disadvantage here. If your assets are scattered all over a region, a county, a state, a country, um, then, um, then yeah, uh, a public network provides you that, that greater uh, nationwide coverage. So now let's have a little look about um, a private network. Remember, you're always providing the end nodes, you're retrieving the data. You're definitely, in this model, going to have to provide your own gateways, but you're also going to have to provide your own LoRaWAN network server. Maybe that's a public or private cloud, maybe it's on-prem. Um, but, but that's the real addition here. You're now having to take control of that core network element, the network server. So let's have a little look at that model quickly. So end nodes um, like Kiros water sensor, which you're going to hear about in a second. When one of those end nodes, those sensors first join the network, it does a join request that goes into the gateway. All of that messaging is sent up to a centralized network server that's typically in a public cloud, but could be um, on-prem in a building as well. And, uh, and if you're a sensor in that network, if you're registered for that network, then 
you'll get a um, an accept to come back. And now in blue, you can see how the payload now goes into the gateway when there's something to be said. And that payload is also pushed up to a cloud or on-prem network server. And that data is routed to the application server, which is where you pick out your data and you send it to your building management system or your Azure cloud or Amazon or wherever you're sending your data. So advantages is that simple integration. You don't have to manage too much about how the network server is working and performing. You just need to be able to capture the data in the gateway and push it to the network server and then pick it up in the application server into your, uh, your platform. So great network, device management all built in, um, low maintenance, fast onboarding. But you have no edge intelligence or decision making down at, at the edge. And, and of course, you've got the OPEX costs of now having a network server. And you have increased um, WAN backhaul costs. Um, and, and typically, you know, if you're in anywhere of a slightly built up environment, you're typically going to be servicing maybe 10% of your own sensors, and you're going to be backhauling up to 90, 95% of other sensors that are in networks around you, which once they get into the network server are disqualified because they're, they're nothing to do with your network. So that's quite a lot of uh, data being pushed back on the backhaul that's essentially garbage. Um, so, you know, point to bear in mind, you're, you're paying for that backhaul cost. And, and you may well be on shared network resources with con, um, contention with others. But this is ideal for wide area networks and it's ideal for sensor to cloud applications like occupancy detection in order to optimize where in the office perhaps you, you wanna clean more uh, based on, on foot traffic. Lastly, um, let's have a little look at distributed network architecture. Um, so again, sensors, applications, they join the network. This time, the network server in this example is distributed inside the gateway. And so now we can have whitelists and blacklists of the sensors on these networks. And we're not backhauling anything that isn't already part of this network. Any of that garbage data from other sensors on other networks is immediately removed. Um, if that sensor is part of this network, then it's provided a unique um, set of keys. So it's very securely protected at the network and the application layer. And that data is served up to the application server into a custom application that is retrieving that data and pumping that data directly into a building or facility management system, perhaps using a native protocol like Modbus, BACnet, or MQTT. So advantages is resiliency, privacy of data, and, and the security of that data because it never leaves the premise. You get the full compatibility with the LoRaWAN ecosystem. You get the edge intelligence that provides you that direct and native integration to a building management system with those reduced WAN backhaul costs, along with zero touch network deployment and, um, and endpoint um, authentication. And, and joining into the network. And this kind of architecture is ideal for connected clustered assets on a central control system, um, kind of applications like lighting control and access uh, control systems. All right, back to you, Byron. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, that was extremely important information. I know when I talk to people, uh, there's sometimes misunderstanding about what, what LoRaWAN is and what it isn't, and um, uh, pointing out that you know you can go, you know, from completely public network access with cloud-based storage, you know, outsourcing everything to keeping everything on-prem uh, is a very important point. You can you know uh, own your own network, do all the processing on-prem, all that kind of stuff. Um, great great points to be made. So, uh, David, we just heard from Daniel um, all the different considerations uh, one must uh, take into account when they're looking at deploying some wireless sensors based on LoRaWAN. Um, what about 
uh, somebody that's got a, an existing building infrastructure or is familiar with, um, you know, more traditional building automation protocols, how would they um, integrate those, or integrate, you know, new LoRaWAN-based devices into that kind of, um, um, you know, environment? And uh, I think you're going to tell us about that. Yep, and that's, that's a great question. So, um, yeah, and thank you for the, the introduction. So my name is David Sherino. Um, I'm with the Industrial Edge Computing Division of Renaissance Electronics, and uh, yeah, we'll get right into um, you know, some of those uh, more specific building automation or building management system applications here. So uh, let's start by taking a quick look at really what that traditional you know, LoRaWAN architecture looks like in a smart building. And, you know, Daniel did a really good job kind of outlining, you know, how these things tie together. So he mentioned, you know, the LoRa network server. So that's, that's the, the area in which the LoRa sensor data is being processed. You know, that data is being received from that, you know, LoRaWAN gateway within that building. And, you know, that, that data can be shared with, you know, various, you know, IoT cloud hubs or cloud applications. But if you look at the smart building architecture, your building management system is isolated from the rest of that data. So you're taking a lot of very valuable data from these LoRaWAN sensors. You're pushing that into the cloud. You're doing a lot of analysis. You've got data over time. You can start making some decisions. So, you know, we call those, you know, I hate using the term, but, you know, actionable, actionable insights, right? So, you know, the action required from one of these insights is now manual. So it requires some human intervention. You've got to you know, get a report, hand it to somebody, uh, give them an idea of what this, you know, this data now says we need to do, and you need to go make some changes to actually create the outcome that you're looking for. So, you know, that's what's one of the struggles that we have with uh, you know, a lot of IoT deployments is that, you know, we, we really have trouble getting to those outcomes. And that's really the, you know, the, the reason that we're making these deployments, because there's a, a business outcome that we need to achieve. So, uh, one way we can start to address that is by adding some edge intelligence uh, at the building that can help manage this data a little bit better. So um, our edge device is called the Smart Server IoT. And one thing that we've done that's quite unique is we've embedded a LoRaWAN network server into the edge. So that doesn't mean you can't use a, a LoRaWAN network server in the cloud because like I just said, we're creating a lot of very valuable insights with these uh, cloud applications. Uh, but what we don't have is that, you know, that local, you know, BMS support. So this might look pretty familiar to some of the network architectures that, that Daniel showed, but what we can see here is that, you know, we, we have that centralized and decentralized approach kind of a, as a hybrid. So you really get to choose, you know, the best options that work for your particular situation. So we're allowing the, the LoRaWAN network server in the cloud and at the edge to coexist. So this allows, through the use of the smart server IoT, real-time sensor data to be shared via BACnet, Modbus, or, you know, whatever the appropriate OT network protocol uh, to be shared directly with the existing building management system. So this removes that, that manual piece that we're, we're needing to, you know, find a way to address. So we can have the edge intelligence uh, sitting at the smart server. It can be sitting at the BMS or both. So uh, we can now program in some actions that we can take to actually achieve these outcomes that we want to, uh, we want to get to. So um, you look at, you know, the arrows here, these are bi-directional. So I wanna, I wanna emphasize this a little bit. So not only can we send data to the BMS uh, or receive data from the cloud, we can send data to the cloud uh, and pull data from it. Meaning if there's a, a deployment in your building that's cloud-based only, that information is now accessible to whatever your on-prem OT systems are. And if that OT system is, say, BACnet, for instance, uh, we can, at the edge, see everything that's going on on that system. So if you don't have support to actually do your intelligence at the building management system or whatever OT system that is, that can happen within the smart server. So um, if, 
you can see how this starts to solve the problem where now we have the ability to you know really just take that last step and you know create the action that these insights have then developed so to really kind of sum this up from more of a, a business standpoint you know what we've been doing is you know defining our issues uh, measuring you know these uh, these data points that are creating the insights for us so we're analyzing that data uh, in the cloud and traditionally you know we're, we're sending a report you know a report might give an action that says you know we need to adjust set points or we have poor indoor air quality or we have a leak uh, you know that that's a, a manual process right now so you know we're gonna put another step in place here which is really improve it and do this in an automated way so that's where this solution allows all of these IOT devices to then become you know, more autonomous and actually drive the outcomes that you need. The reporting is still important because that becomes our control. So we need to you know, take action and then decide, hey, did that work? How well did it work? And do we need to make any adjustments or maybe start uh, defining or measuring other things? So you know, a lot of people will recognize these steps you know, as Really, this is your Six Sigma approach for you know continuous improvement. So at the end of the day, you know, what we're all looking for is you know achieving a business goal. So using this kind of approach with this hybrid technology allows you to you know do things that Byron stressed at the beginning: meet your ESG goals, you know reduce your risk, you know have an actual uh, bottom line benefit uh, to your uh, to your business uh, by using IoT. So um, I hope that gave some uh, some valuable insight. Next, we've got uh, Seth. So I'll give that back over to you, Byron. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, I love that ending slide. And one of my favorite sayings um, I use frequently in the space is that which can be measured can be improved. So, you know, if you're not actually collecting the data and knowing where you stand, you can't do anything about it. You can't improve it. So, and that's, that's what IoT is all about, is collecting data, lots of data from lots of different things. Um, okay, so uh, we're, we're kind of um, we started here, Seth, with uh, with Frederick uh, showing how they're able to use LoRaWAN in a, a certain way for uh, to improve energy efficiency, reduce carbon emissions, uh, provide a good um, ROI on um, you know reduced energy costs for a customer. Um, we heard from Dan and David, uh, you know, the considerations and how to implement these systems um, in the built environment. And we'll end here uh, with you, um, who I think is going to show, uh, highlight a, a alternative way that all this data can be used uh, in the built environment uh, to make the workplace um, safer and more efficient. So um, go ahead and take it away, Seth. Thanks, Byron. Um, and as we've been talking about on this, uh, on our webinar here, um, the LoRaWAN network has a wide and expanding variety of sensors that are becoming available, making it simpler and more cost effective to blanket a building with sensors and get that real time data across a building or maybe even a portfolio of buildings that can reduce our exposure to risk. Um, there are things like newer equipment that can be self-diagnostic and give us feedback, um, but there's also a, gro a large stock of uh, legacy equipment that cannot be or is too costly to retrofit and bring into um, the fold of, of sensors that we have nowadays. Um, there's also new construction where um, it's actually more effective nowadays to put in the wireless sensors because they're cheaper and easier to install rather than running wire everywhere. Um, and we can take this wide array of sensors that are no really easy to employ, low cost, and get new telemetry, fill in the gaps where we're missing telemetry data from our buildings um, and create new capabilities um, that can interface with old systems like what David was saying with uh, the smart server IoT um, and, and give us uh, new ways to automate and um, reduce the risk in our buildings. So um, whether it's from a capital outlay or ongoing maintenance cost, um, it hasn't been easier net, it hasn't been easier than now to um, execute using LoRaWAN. Um, Byron mentioned it, that sensors now last up maybe up to 10 years or beyond because of the efficiencies we have with the LoRaWAN technology. We're sending bits of information, um, temperature on, off, open, close, that kind of information, 
And it's overkill to send this over something like a Wi-Fi network that's high bandwidth and you'd have to blanket the building with a multiple more of routers than you would using something like a LoRaWAN gateway. Um, then once we're able to blanket the building now with these sensors across you know, the spectrum of what we need to measure, we have to share those insights with our teams and there's multiple applications in the LoRaWAN universe that allow us to share information in real time with uh, like maintenance teams, tenants, um, building operators, whoever needs to know, and, and achieve some sort of escalation path that allows us to react in real time before a, something that would be a catastrophe in the building just it becomes a, an inconvenience. Um, and when we can introduce things like machine endpoints um, to what Frederick was saying earlier, we can start to automate um, and, and even start to, to do things if we detect a leak, which I will get to, to speak about in a minute, um, detect a leak, we could react and shut off valves or pumps and prevent further damage from uh, cascading through a building. Um, so uh, Kairos is a uh, leak detection and water control company, and one of, the, one of our products is a leak detection membrane. Um, and leak detection itself lends is a very great use is a great use case for LoRaWAN because it is such a small amount of data and in order to get the full benefit you want to be able to to put these sensors everywhere so across boilers chillers um, pump rooms in units to detect any uh, early detection of leaks around appliances or fixtures um, and we want to be able to do that um, kind of on a whole scale um, and the the other reason this is a great um, application um, for LoRaWAN is that across the U.S., annual claims are about $20 billion annually. Um, that's a lot of money. And if you compound that with the growing cost of water as a utility um, and the fact that water itself is both you, consumes electricity and gas anyway in most buildings where it needs to be pumped, it needs to be heated, it needs to be treated throughout the building. Um, it is a growing concern. Um, in our case, we've we had a uh, an example where we were we were wooing a client in California, and we sent them a pilot system to test. But before they could even get that installed, they had a leak in one of their risers that led to hundreds of thousands of damage, um, and immediately prompted them to go and install our system uh, across their property, which was why and it, they needed to use the LoRaWAN technology to get across because it was. Uh, too disparate in order to be able to retrieve that sensor and signal information um, remotely. Um, so when they did install, it was actually a few months later, this is perfect use case, they had another flood that um, they were able to get on site immediately and remedy. Um, so I've given the example of leak detection, but you know, there's many other sensors that you could put in the scenario, especially environmental sensors, where you can see the same use case and the same return. Um, so kind of to summarize here, there, there's a way to increase your building efficiency. Um, and actually there's a McKinsey and Company study that claims there's a 6 to 9% increase in NOI from simply installing an IoT system, um, kind of for the reasons we've been talking about. There's new types of automation that are available when you're collecting more information from your, from your building. And one example um, is you know, adjusting light and HVAC schedules based on occupancy. Um, and anytime you can take your operations from being reactive in nature to being preventive or even predictive using machine learning, um, you're able to eliminate unwanted downtime or unscheduled downtime um, and overall increase the efficiency of the building. Um, you can also, as Byron alluded to, you can increase um, auditing and tracking efforts with ESG. Uh, there's a BlackRock survey that says 53% of ESG investors are finding that there's a lack of, of quality data and availability of the data that is kind of holding them back as being a barrier to adopting um, sustainable investing. Um, you can reduce your MRO costs. We've kind of been harping on that uh, this, um, this whole webinar is that you can minimize damages by just reacting a lot faster or even automating things um, within your building. And finally, insurance costs. We've been working with uh, insurers to, to quantify 
and, and get data on how they can offer new um, structures of premiums and deductibles for their customers. And even if you're self-insured, um, that's real money that comes out of your pocket that you're prepared to pay for events that you could re easily mitigate or reduce using this a new sensor network within your building. Um, and with that, I'll hand everything back over to you, Byron. Whoops. All right. Uh, thank you, Seth. Um, and thanks to everybody. On uh, I'm, I'm going to thank you on behalf of the audience for keeping it short and sweet and to the point. Um, we know how attention spans are these days, so uh, you know. Thanks for uh, getting the, the key messages out there in a in a timely fashion. Um, everybody, uh, you know, continue to put your questions and answers um, in the in the Q and A box now. Um, and uh, I do want before we uh, get to the questions and answers, uh, I do want to point out the upcoming Lorawan World Expo. Um, if you, you know, there is no better place to, you know, learn everything about LoRaWAN, um, if that's something of interest to you. Um, coming up in, in Paris, July 6th and 7th, uh, you can scan the QR code there or go to the Laura, Laura Alliance website um, and get more information. It's going to be two days of, uh, you know, lots of information. Many pe people in the ecosystem will be there um, and you can interact and ask questions, meet people one on one directly. Um, so with that, uh, give us a few minutes to uh, uh, scan the questions that have come in and we will begin the Q&A. Okay, let's get on with the questions and answers here. Uh, I have to say, I've done a few of these webinars and we have some really good questions today. Um, e excellent, excellent job. So um, I'll just kind of uh, get it rolling here. So um, I think we'll start here with one that's specifically directed to uh, uh, Frederick, um, which is, does Virtuz use a connection from the LoRa gateway directly to building control systems? or does all data flow through the cloud? Well, actually, um, the solution is providing uh, an optimizing efficiency of HVAC systems through the uh, artificial intelligence, uh, predictive model, and stuff like that. So basically, we are decoding some of the payload locally, but uh, all the data are going to the cloud and sent back later with the actuation order for, for the HVAC, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one out here uh, about sort of involving public and private networks. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of combine two questions. Um, uh, with the distributed network server um, where the gateway, has, uh, the gateway has the network server in it, um, does that mean we have to log in or input each independent gateway for network server admins separately instead of a centralized cloud network server, or are these edge gateways also controlled from a centralized point? And I'll kind of ask a, a corollary question to that. But Dan, do you want to address that first? Yeah, sure. Um, so a distributed architecture doesn't necessarily have to run the network server in the gateway. It could be locally um, the IT room connected to a number of gateways in that facility. But it's a good question, Jose. Um, yeah, in, in, in a simple um, configuration where perhaps you run the network server in the gateway, maybe you're doing a POC and a trial, um, then, yeah, every time you want to update how that application is reporting, change whitelists, blacklists of endpoints, you physically need to log into that gateway to access the network server to, to make those changes. However, um, there are ways in which you can centralize all of the management, and, and this is really idealized. You, you get your cake and eat it because you have all of the user data distributed at the edge, connecting LoRaWAN sensors into, I don't know, BACnet building management system. Um, but then you centralize all your control of these networks with traffic policy, security policy, 
Um, you can service uh, endpoint requests for unique um, keys and, and rekeying of those devices. All of this can be done centrally for one network or a, a whole group of networks um, into a common account. So, so in a simple sense, you you you, you have to uh, distribute everything. But for scalability, um, you you only distribute the user data and you centralize control. Okay. Um, great. So, uh, a, a kind of a, a keeping with the private network theme, we have a question here from Steve. Um, and the question is, is a private network the best way to achieve closed loop control with LoRaWAN? Uh, David, I'll throw that one to you. Um, and Steve, if we don't uh, understand the correct question correctly, if you want to elaborate in the Q and A, we'll we'll try and um, address it better if if we don't get it the first time. So, David, do you, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and uh, to me, closed loop control is you know you're taking an input you know from the device and you're you're creating you know a set point change. You're running it through a PID loop, and that needs to be fairly quick. So that's not typically something that you would want to do from the cloud. You know, we're not going to command a, a chilled water valve. To, re to reset a supplier temperature on an air handler from the cloud, that needs to happen at the edge. So uh, with the private network, you've really got the real-time data, so you're not relying on the cloud and you don't have that latency. So yes, definitely the private network is what you want if you're going to actually be using this as a supplement to your building automation system. Okay, cool. Um, let's see, another one here for Frederick. I believe this came in when you were talking. Um, so a question about the statement made of 300 buildings optimized. This is from Jose. Um, can you go over briefly what optimized means? Uh, what went into optimizing a building? Thank you, Joseph, for, for the question. Indeed, what do we mean when we say optimizing the HX system of the building? Well, basically, uh, you have uh, the traditional behavior and performance level for, uh, from a BMS. And what we are providing is the power of the cloud, the power of intelligence, artificial sorry, intelligence, predictive model, machine learning, in order to cross additional data and to really um, send command to the HVAC in order to deliver uh, the proper energy in order to secure the comfort. So basically, when we say optimizing, we are talking about energy efficiency. Okay, and uh, in average, uh, regarding the 300 buildings we, we've been equipped with the solution, we are on an average optimization of 25%. Okay, okay, good. Um, we'll, we'll just keep rolling here. I want to make sure we get as many of these in as we can. Uh, Seth. Um, one from Gabriel here. Um, how does Cairo sensor data integrate into the BMS? Is it a silo application, API, raw data? Can you elaborate on how your uh, architecture works? Yeah, so there, there are actually multiple ways that we can do that. Um, and we've been working with uh, Renaissance and uh, using their smart server IoT to uh, actually, they're, they're running a, an LNS locally right there. And so all of our data can go into that LNS, you broken up and distributed to the BMS through that method as well, or that, that would be a preferred method here. But we have APIs um, designed and developed specifically to deliver the data in real time. Um, but again, that would be, um, you would be able to use that in sort of a closed loop setting. Um, but we are working at putting an application on the smart server IoT as well that could, could run that um, some of our cloud functions locally as well. Um, does that answer the question? Uh, it seems to. Uh, Gabriel, if, if you want to, if that didn't, uh, please just add in the, in the Q&A box here and we'll, we'll revisit it. Um, so uh, here's one from Francisco. Um, what protocols are recommended for the back end? Are you using LoRa just for the sensor information slash collection? Um, David, you want to you want to take a first stab at that one? Sure. Uh, yeah, for, you know, for the the sensor data, LoRa really is the preferred way, and I think we we covered a lot of reasons why. And it's very easy 
uh, inexpensive to deploy, uh, very low cost and very robust. So, you know, getting <clears throat> getting the data is just the first step. So we do use Laura for that. You know, on the back end side, there's a lot of different uh, systems that could be in a building. There could be a lot of different uh, cloud environments that maybe like their data in a certain way. So, you know, from the smart server perspective, there's a lot of options on how you can push that data out in the back end. We've used, you know, Modbus for SCADA systems, BACnet for you know, building automation systems. And then we've also, you know, needed to go into some uh, ERP systems and we can just use an MQTT API that we have on board to do that. So um, that, that answer that question really is it depends on, you know, what that system is that you're trying to connect to, but um, there's a lot of flexibility there and being able to connect to most of what's out there. Okay, uh, yeah, Dan, if I can, uh, if I can also that. add to that, uh, Byron, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. one yes. of the, uh, the the question here was uh, what protocols are recommended for the back end? Well, in a sense, that depends on your back end, doesn't it? As David just said, maybe um, a SCADA system uses Modbus, a production piece of equipment uses OPC UA, building management systems actually use all of these protocols and BACnet and, and others too. And so it's really that back end that dictates the protocol that gets used. And this is where the disconnect comes in. We're collecting data off of sensors that are often battery powered and awkward to reach uh, places and um, limited to maybe no more than 11 bytes in, in the US. And um, and how do we now integrate that data into a backend that's expecting to see Modbus, OPC, UA, or, or BACnet? And so where do you now do that conversion? In, in some instances, you can literally do this on a sensor. Yeah, a basic Modbus implementation can be done at the sensor level. It's uh, designed uh, essentially for a constrained interface. But other protocols like OPC UA and, and BACnet, for example, there's no way that those protocols are running on a constrained interface. So now that integration needs to be done north of the network server. And so this is why I highlighted how these internal um, closed loop control systems, how, how doing this on prem makes a lot of sense because sending all of that data up into a cloud to then manipulate that LoRaWAN data into a format like Modbus to bring it all the way back down into the building um, architecturally just isn't particularly efficient. Um, so, so, so really it just depends on your back end and there are many protocols out there that are phenomenally successful and have been deployed all around the world. Uh, building management systems have used most of them. Yeah, and there's a number of products on the market now, uh, you know, one of which is the one David spoke about from Renaissance that, that make that uh, integration much simpler than it was maybe even two years ago. So, uh, yes, and just uh, as a little tip, just because uh, a little tidbit here that's uh, very relevant, um, I, I lead our industrial work group and I submitted a proposal uh, for consideration by the Laura uh, Alliance Roadmap Committee. Um, to, to address integration and best practices for a number of these protocols so that we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel every time we want inter, to integrate LoRa to these uh, back-end protocols. A okay, very great. relevant topic. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm going to try and squeeze two more questions in here um, really quickly. Mm -hmm. Seth, this is, this is one um, for you. Um, you know, when you talk about leak detection, sometimes you know, it's a little bit hard to prove a negative. In other words, if they haven't had a leak, they don't know what the consequences would be. Uh, what, you know, how do you talk to your customers? What would you tell people to consider when they're looking at uh, whether or not there's a return for deploying a leak detection system such as uh, Kairos offers? Yeah, and, and we do get that question a lot. And I think um, early on when we were trying to, to sell leak detection, it was difficult because a lot of the operators that we were going to didn't their their uh, maintenance and repair budgets weren't really categorized by this is you know this was leak this was organic growth this was whatever um, so it was hard to break that out and go back to them and say well here's what we're going to save um, but over time as we've started to um, deploy um, we've been able to compound you know reduced organic growth claims reduced um, you know, having to go in and and just gut 
a unit or several units that are um, maybe in a, in, a, in a vertical stack. Um, and so the easiest way to look at it now is, you know, you, we go in and we say, well, let's go and look at how many uh, apartments or units you've had to renovate due to organic growth or, you know, water, water, other water issues. And it, it very quickly comes out to when we, when we say we're going to contract out a system and they go in and actually look at the number of units that they've had issues with over the, like the last year, it's usually multiples uh, our system is multiples less than all the growth claims that uh, growth or damage claims that they they can attribute to water related issues. So uh, I think long winded answer to say um, it, it usually we we know it's months. We know that the payback period for installing a leak detection system um, and and you could even apply this to other sensors as well. But for us. It, it's not going to be years. It is it is eight to twelve months that we're seeing payback for in just monitoring and early detection of leaks. Long winded answer. There you go. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, and we got one question here, Dan. In thirty seconds, if you can, a question about the um, basically security. Um, you know, are there any concerns, things to keep in mind when edge devices are compromised? AKA physical unauthorized access as opposed to centralized cloud data. He's trying to compare the edge gateway security versus cloud security. Yeah, yeah, I see that. The two types of uh, main attack vectors, uh, the man in the middle attacking over the air interface, and then of course the, uh, the physical uh, access to devices and sensors. So bear in mind that these private networks are inside private facilities with you know, gated entrance and, and card key access. Not to say it's impossible to, to tamper with the hardware, of course it is, um, but you know, these are secure environments typically. It's not like the general public just walking past. So, so there is a level of overall security there. Um, the actual security of the sensors to the gateway to the network server, this is all baked into the LoRaWAN specs and it's highly secure. So that uh, man in the middle attack is not there. Uh, unique keys, for example, being used. The gateways have to have, you know, passwords, they have to be unique passwords, they're not the same passwords across a fleet of gateways. Uh, the cloud-based platforms that centrally manage these distributed architectures are all tested against SOC 2 compliance. So, so it's really much the same. If you've got physical access, um, it, it, it's, it's for sure uh, more difficult to prevent uh, intrusion. Not impossible, but, um, but you need that physical access. Uh, from a man in the middle perspective, it's no different than a cloud based architecture. Okay, well, uh, we've gone a couple of minutes over, so uh, I'm going to wrap things up uh, here. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the, the people who've listened online to the webinar, also for the great questions. Thank you to the panelists, um, and thank you for the Laura Alliance for hosting this and, and putting it on. So, uh, we will be having another um, webinar on smart buildings uh, in the in the early fall. So uh, please uh, please look out for that information coming forth on that. Thanks again for joining.